Well, did you bring a copy of God's Word this morning? You're going to need it. Please open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 44. We've been away from the book of Isaiah for a couple of weeks, but you remember we're kind of marching through it, and uh, this will be the seventh message in the book of Isaiah. I just want to remind you of uh, the context into which this was written. Remember, Isaiah was a prophet that God sent with a message to a sinful nation. And so even though this book is 2,700 years old, I can't think of another place in the Bible that is more applicable to what is going on right here, right now in contemporary culture. Um, Isaiah was God's man. He was a prophet that was sent to preach through four different political administrations. There were four different kings that had to endure prophets, uh, uh, Isaiah's prophecy, and yet Isaiah showed no favoritism. He just spoke truth no matter what the consequences were. Um, he wasn't um, in anybody's political camp. He wasn't aligned with any particular political party. He was just there to call people to repent. Uh, there's three themes in the book of Isaiah that we told you about. Um, Isaiah is either talking about sin, God's judgment on sin, or he's giving hope to a people who have endured judgment because of sin. Uh, we saw in the first 39 chapters about how God's brought judgment upon these people. Remember the context. These were God's people, God's chosen people. God had given them eternal promises that he would make them into a great nation. They would be a great people. They would dwell in a particular land, and God would send them a redeemer. And yet, by the time we get to Isaiah's prophecy, there had been wicked kings and wicked rulers. The people had fallen into to immorality and idolatry. They had forgotten God. They turned their backs on God and they were beginning to trust other things besides God, which set them up for judgment. There were nations aligned on their border, particularly Babylon. And by the time we get to chapter 40 and 44 in the section we're going to be looking at right now, Isaiah is anticipating what was about to happen. Now, I know it's hard for you to imagine, but let me tell you what happened. A riotous mob came to the capital city in Isaiah. They went to the most important building in Israel, and they broke through security and attempted an overthrow of the Israeli government. I know this is hard to imagine. I know you've never seen anything like this before. I know the Bible is very antiquated. It's very hard for us to draw any application out of Scripture. But that was what was happening 2,700 years ago. And into that situation, God speaks a word of hope. What had happened was Babylon had drug the children of Israel out of the promised land to a place in Babylon. Babylon, you probably don't know much about Babylon. Babylon was a pagan culture. They worshiped idols. And there was a variety of idols that you could bow down to to try to appease the gods, uh, the imaginary gods in Babylon. And the fear was that there would be no next generation of God-fearing people on the earth. The fear of the parents is that the children would be assimilated into this pagan culture and the next generation would worship pagan gods and there would be no fulfillment of God's promise that he would make them into a great nation. There would be a king that would rule forever on the throne of David. And so Israel's asking the question, is there hope for us? Has God forsaken us? Is there going to be a next generation? Should we trust God to get us out of Babylon? Is there any way that God can get us out of Babylon back to the promised land? Or should we look to something else to trust, something else to worship? And what we're going to discover is before God would get them out of Babylon, God had to get Babylon out of them. Same is true for us. Here's what we're going to understand this morning. While we, here in 2021 in America, while we are waiting for God to get us out of here, by the way, let me just pause right there. Anybody in favor of getting out of here? 
Anybody like, you know, is there any way out of this mess? Like, is there an escape hatch somewhere? Is there a transfer portal somewhere? Can we just, can we just move on to heaven? Is there any way of getting out of this? Listen, while we are waiting for God to get us out of here, God wants to get the idols here out of us. There's hope. And that's why we open to the book of Isaiah. I want to begin to read in Isaiah chapter 44, beginning in verse 6. Listen, as the God of all creation speaks a word of hope to a people who are living among idols. Verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel. How many kings did Israel have? Not a lot of kings. They had bad kings. They had some good kings. They had some bad kings. But it's great after all the kings had done all the kings, all the things that kings could do. God says, you want to know who your king is? It's me. The Lord, the king of Israel and his redeemer. Oh, the king has a redeemer. I wonder who that is. Oh yeah, that's Jesus. He's going to show up about 700 years later to redeem Israel and all the nations that serve him. So the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, says this. I am the first and the last. That means from all of eternity past to all of eternity future, King Jesus never changes. I am the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Do you see the word God there in, at the end of verse 6? Do you notice that word God has a little g? So there apparently are little gods with little g's that rival the true God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now he says, besides me there is no God. Verse 7, who is like me? Let him proclaim it. He's saying, make your case. If you think you can compare to who I am, then I'll give you opportunity. Make your case. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come. All right, so tell the future. And, and what will happen? Verse 8, fear not, nor be afraid. There's probably some here, somebody here today that's really the only thing you needed to hear. I mean, no matter what else you're going to hear today, no matter what songs we're going to sing, God brought you here to hear those words. Fear not. Don't be afraid. But there is a reason that we fear. The reason we fear is because we don't know and trust this true and living God. But if God has your worship, you have no reason to fear. Fear not, nor be afraid, have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there a God, big G, besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Rock is symbolic of what you build your life on. It's the foundation. Everything else is built upon the rock-solid foundation of God for every believer. But there is a threat to our worship. Here, here's what happens. Instead of worshiping the true and the living God, here's what we do. We build our idols. That's what he goes on and tells us here in verse 9. Notice what it says. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know, and they may be, that they may be put to shame. Verse 10. Who fashions a God or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Who would do that? What a stupid thing. Verse 11, behold, all his companions shall be put to shame and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. You know what brings terror and fear? It's when our hearts fall prey to idol worship, idolatry. Now, when I say the word idol in such a contemporary, sophisticated crowd like this, look how sophisticated you people are. You're educated. Most of you graduated the eighth grade and, and you know, you, you made passing grades and, and you, you're in a modern Western technological society and you have access to all kinds of information. So when we talk about Idol worship. 
I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about these little statues that primitive people in the remotest parts of the earth carve and bow down to and offer sacrifices to. They have these sun gods and moon gods and fertility gods and they're just hoping that the gods will smile favorably upon them so that it'll rain at the right time and they'll have some crops or their, their, their women will be fertile and they'll have babies. And, and aren't you glad you're not an idol worshiper? Aren't you glad you're not like those silly people that worship little man-made gods? I would like to make the case this morning that there is more idol worship happening in America than any place on earth. Idolatry is the universal condition of the fallen human heart. Idolatry is the sin behind every other sin. What's the first commandment? You know the Ten Commandments? You've heard of those, top, God's top ten? What's the first one? You know what it is? Here it is. It's in Exodus chapter 20. God says, first commandment, you shall have no other gods with little g's before me. God knows it's a temptation to stray from him, to make idols and bow down and give our worship to someone other than God. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Does that confuse you that God's jealous? I thought jealousy was a sin. How petty of God to be jealous. I heard, I heard Oprah one time that, that what, what tripped her up and, and got her worshiping all kinds of other gods, was the fact that God was a jealous God. Listen, God is the only one in the universe allowed to be jealous. He makes an exclusive claim on what you love. And if you love any other thing more than you love God, it provokes jealousy in God's heart because you were created exclusively to love and worship and bow down to the creator God. So in the second book of the Bible, we see this warning. Do not have any other gods before me. It continues throughout the Bible. We get to the book of Romans, one of the most important theological books in the Bible. In the first chapter of the most important theological book, we read this. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Are you a creative person? How many of you would consider yourself a creative person? Raise your hand if somebody's ever told you, my, you're a creative person. Others of you are like, never created anything in my life. That's okay. Maybe you have a friend who's creative. Do you know why you're creative? You're creative because your creator has stamped his image upon you. God is creator, and because he created you as his creature, you are creative. So do you know what we do as humans? We create things. The more creative you are, the more prone you are to worship what you create. Creatures worshiping creation is idolatry. We get to almost the back of the Bible, almost the, the, the very end of the Bible, and, and, and John is writing to a church, and he's warning them, and he teaches them, I'm writing all these things so that you will believe and know that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And the last thing he says is like, little children, just, just one more thing, just, just, just one more thing. Keep yourselves from idols. He's not, worship, he's not writing to a primitive African tribe. He's writing to a people who have already ascribed lordship to Jesus Christ. People who already have eternal life. And yet John recognizes idol worship is a universal temptation for every human being. It is at the root of every sin we commit. So we create our idols. Then you know what we do? We worship our idols. Here, look at verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool. Underline the word tool. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers 
and works with a strong arm. He becomes hungry and he's, his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches out a line. It's a measuring tool. And he marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass, another tool. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. What's he doing? He's making an idol. And then he begins to dwell with his idol. The idol becomes familiar. He beautifies the idol. And then he dwells with the idol. Then verse 14 says, he cuts down cedars and he chooses cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow among the, the trees of the forest. And he plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man and he takes a part of it and warms himself and he kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire because he's cold, he needs warmth. Over half of it he eats meat because he's hungry. He roasted it, he's satisfied, it was good food. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down and worship it. Isaiah is mocking people who make idols. It seems so foolish to us. How stupid. Why would stupid people make idols out of wood and stone and iron? Notice all the tools that are employed in the making of an idol. He mentions an ironsmith and a carpenter. These are skilled craftsmen. Do you understand? The more resources you have, things like cedar, things like wood, things like money, things like talent, things like education, things like influence, the more resources you have, the more tempted you will be to turn the resources into idols, things you bow down to, things you worship, things you will never let go of. And the more skilled and educated you are, the more elaborate you can make your idols. Listen, a lot of people think, well, nobody would worship an idol. I mean, like, you're, you're talking about like devil worship, right? Devil worship. Do you know the devil is really not all that concerned if you worship him? He just wants you to worship something other than God. And that can be good things. Most people think, well, idols are really bad things. Listen, idols are actually most often made out of good things. Idols are good things that we make into God things. They're good things that we make into ultimate things. Things like marriage, things like coffee, things like houses, things like cars, things like relationships, things like love, things like church can actually become things that we bow down to other than God. Then, after we worship our idols, we begin to trust our idols. Look at verse 17. The end of verse 17 says, He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you, idol, are my God. Deliver me. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I'm, I'm, I'm out of resources. I need help. I need a Savior. So he turns to his God of his own making. Verse 18 says, They know not. They do not discern. For he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see. And their hearts, underline the word heart, so that they cannot understand. Verse 19, No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, Half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And I shall make the rest of it an abomination. Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Notice, idols make promises that can, they cannot fulfill. Idols promise to do what only God can do. Why do sophisticated people like us, why are we tempted to trust our idols? The reason is because they're visible and they're immediate and they make promises to us. Idols are functional saviors. Why do we need God when we have money? We don't need to trust God 
when we have money. I met a guy after the first service in, out in the foyer, and he came by. He's like, thanks for the message. He's like, I got to tell you a story. He's like, um, years ago, I was in a church, and I heard my, my pastor was going to preach on idolatry, and I thought, I'll pray for everybody in the church, because surely I don't have any idols. And as the guy was preaching, he realized that every day he would open um, an account where he had a particular amount of money. He'd gotten a bonus or something. He just kind of stuck his bonus in there. And every day he would just open it up and just look at the number for a while. And he said, I was so convicted that that was an act of worship. I realized as long as that money was there, I was trusting my money rather than trusting God. You see how easily sophisticated people like us can take good things like money and make them into God things. Listen, the more fearful you are, the more tempted you are to put your trust in things that promise deliverance or the things that promise happiness. Do you know that every advertisement, every commercial, every billboard is an opportunity for you to get your need met by an idol? It's basically saying, if you had this, you would be happy. Trust it. Here's a new vacuum. Here's a new app on your phone. Trust it. It'll make you happy. It will take care of your need. It will deliver you. Whatever you run to when you are frightened reveals what you worship. So what do you run to when 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 you're afraid, when you're scared? Do you run to God? Do you trust God? What do you ask to deliver you when you're frightened, when you're facing something more powerful than you? So we build our idols, we worship our idols, we trust our idols, and then, tragically, we're deluded by our idols. Look here at verse 20. He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. He cannot deliver himself or say... Is there not a lie in my right hand? Everybody make a fist with your right hand. Everybody make a fist. Now, the question is, what lie are you holding on to that is feeding your idolatry? A deluded heart. This is not diluted heart like a watered down heart. This means a deceived heart. When we begin to worship idols, when we bow down to idols, we're believing the lie that the idol can provide for us what only God can provide. And if you have gripped a lie and will not turn loose of the lie, you will never be able to properly and exclusively worship God. Uh, This past... uh, a couple of weeks, um, Andrew and I, our family, we got to, to have a little vacation time. We, we got a little rental home down in Florida. And um, there, the, I don't know who the people were that we rented the home from, but they, were, they, they had little Buddhas everywhere. Have you ever seen the little Buddhas everywhere? It, I, I haven't ever figured that out because the Buddha is actually the opposite of what I want to look like when I grow up, right? I mean, Buddha is what I would look like if I worshiped Krispy Kreme donuts and, and, and that. So I don't, I don't want to be like that. But it's like, it just looks so foolish to us. And the other thing we did, is, is we rented a car to drive around, and this car was really cool. It had this, this new, have you seen these new cars that have these lane departure systems? Like if you're not paying attention or you're texting or while you're driving, which you shouldn't do, uh, children, is not do that. Uh, it, it, like you start to drift out of your lane and it kind of throws you back in the other lane or it, it screams at you a little bit. That's a great, so I wish I could install one of those in my heart that when I started to drift out of the worship lane, that it would just steer me back together. Oh, wait a minute. We already have one of those. It's called the Holy Spirit. It's called Gospel City Church. It's called your pastor. I'm, I'm your lane departure system this morning here to pull us back from things that delude our hearts. Here's what we have to understand. If it's still not making the connection, please understand this. The human heart is an idol factory, Okay? Your heart was made to worship. Sometimes I think, if if you're not quite familiar, if you haven't been around here very much, we put so much energy and excitement, and Mike is such a great worship leader, that sometimes, if we're not careful, we think that worship starts that moment 
when Micah stands up and says, everybody get on your feet, let's, let's give our worship to the Lord. And then it ends when he fades away and Trent comes out and says, open the Bible. Listen, if that's your understanding of worship, first of all, you've misunderstood what Micah and I are trying to do and you've misunderstood worship. Worship is what your heart was created to do 24 hours a day, seven days of work, a week. And your heart cannot not worship. You say, I'm an atheist, I don't worship. Oh, yes, you do. It's the only thing you can do because it's what you were created to do. The question is not, do you worship God? The question is, what God do you worship? If your heart will not worship God, your heart will find something else to worship. And when your heart finds something else to worship, that's idolatry. Anything can be an idol. Worship, or idolatry is simply misdirected worship. And by the way, idols will not demand your exclusive worship. Your idols usually don't get jealous if you worship other things. Your, your idols will not demand you to renounce your worship of Jesus. Idols just kind of want to peel off just a piece of your heart, just a piece that belongs to Jesus, and, and delude you and dilute you from exclusively worshiping the only one who is worthy of our worship. But anything can be an idol. Let's, let's get a little more specific here. What, what's an idol? An, an idol is anything more important to me than God. What, what do you find yourself thinking about? What do you find yourself consumed with? What is your heart absorbed with? Anything that absorbs your heart is an idol. Anything that I love more than God. I, I trust that you love God, but do you love something even more than God. Um, how many of you have ever attended a wedding ceremony that I have officiated? Raise your hand if you've attended. A Did I marry anybody in here? I see some people. Y'all still married? Good. Okay, good. It worked. All right, so listen. One of the things that Isaiah and Allie heard me say is something I say at every wedding. I usually look, look them in the eye. They're trying to look at each other. and I don't know. I just, Like, hey, just, just for a second here, could we focus on something? Here's your charge. Isaiah, Love Allie more than you love yourself. But Isaiah, love Allie less than God. Because if you love Allie more than God, number one, you're sinning against Allie and you're sinning against God. Allie needs you to love God more than you love her. Because she will tell God on you if you love anything more than God. Do you get it? Anything we love more than God is an idol. Last week, again, on vacation, um, my children, when we're driving around, it's my opportunity to hear songs that I would never listen to on my own. And um, I get to hear the playlist and all the new music coming out. Oh, Dad, here's one. And I'm like, okay. So my, my kids know, of course, I'm a pastor, so I have to critique the lyrics of the song through the lens of Scripture, right? This is an occupational hazard for pastor's kids. They understand this. It's a risk to play a song in front of Dad because he may give you a sermon. Uh, and, and so they, one of my children played this song. It's a country song, right, which is probably the first sign that something's going bad. Um, <laughs> Here's the lyrics of the song. Your kisses have a higher power. Well, that sounds like a spiritual statement, doesn't it? Every time I see you smile, it's like I've seen the light. Want to glorify every part of you so bad. Don't get me wrong, I'm a God-fearing Christian man, but if you were a religion, then I don't know what I'd do. I might have to worship you. I might have to sing your praise. I might have to go to church every single night and day. I might have to hit my knees because you lay it on me like the truth. And you love me like hallelujah. I might have to worship you. Now I'm needing the lane avoidance system, okay? So I'm like, whoa, hang on here. 
Now, I want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. He says, God-fearing Christian man. Okay, okay, but hey, God-fearing Christian man, you are in the territory of idolatry because you can't peel off your worship and give it to anything other than God. Love your spouse more than yourself. Love your spouse less than God. Anything that seeks Anything you will not give up for God. So he's like, I'll give up my wife for God. I'm like, no, you don't understand. That's not what we're saying, okay? Love your wife more than yourself. Love your wife less than God. Is there anything that you wouldn't give up? Again, this is, this is a giving issue for us. You hear us talk about the giving around here. I'm so grateful for people that, that give up. But ev- every time you give, it is an opportunity for you to crush the idol of money in your life. And if you can't give... Your problem is not that you don't have enough money, it's that you don't have enough worship. Anything you will not give up for God is an idol. Anything that seeks to define my identity. This is why social media can be a house of worship. Because as you scroll through, what are you doing? You're, you're looking for things that try to define you. It's like, oh, they're wearing that shirt. I need that shirt. I need to be like them. I want to be like, look at the pretty people. Look at the powerful people. We don't call them idols, we call them influencers. Anything that promises to complete my happiness. If only I had that, I would be happy. And that's what every product is telling you. If you would buy our product, you would be happy. Anything that promises to secure my future is an idol. Let's get a little more specific. By the way, everybody thinks idolatry is stupid until somebody puts their finger on your idol. Like, who would worship somebody? Who would listen to a stupid song like that? Well, let's see if we can identify your idol. What are the American idols? By the way, Simon Cowell doesn't get to assign who the American idols are. They're just all over the place, all right? So how about this? The idol of personality. They're the influencers. They're the pretty people. They're the powerful people. They're the popular people. Or they're simply my people. It's my family. Did you know that your children can become an idol. We we, we try to appease them, right? We try to give them what, sacrifice to them so that they, we get them to, to do what we want them to do or they become the central focus of our life. I've even known some husbands and wives that have sacrificed their marriage to the idol of their children. You've heard the word codependency, you know what that is? It's when a person is so consumed with fixing a broken person that they become codependent upon the person? That's called codependency. That's also called idolatry. When that person has so consumed you, their repair, fixing them, training them, changing them, becomes the focus of your life. It's idolatry. We have idols of security. That's where wealth and retirement accounts and and possessions, and homes, and and safety becomes an idol. I said to you a few weeks ago, when you're consumed by fear, safety becomes your idol. You won't risk anything. You, 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 I don't want to get sick. I don't want to stub my toe. I don't want to, I don't want to look stupid. I I don't want to fail, so I don't try. That, that's when safety becomes an idol. We have idols of significance, career advancement, Achievement, accomplishment, productivity. None of those are bad, but remember, we take good things and turn them into God things. Idols of pleasure, food and entertainment and sports, leisure, gaming, beauty, romance, sex. By the way, for every idol, do you know that these idols have houses of worship? So for people who worship sports, we have stadiums. For people who worship artistry, we have theaters. For people who worship entertainment, we have Netflix. For people who worship food, we have restaurants. For people who worship fitness, we have gyms. For people who worship music, we have Spotify and Apple Music and radio. For people who worship influencers, we have social media. For people who worship stuff, we have Amazon Prime. For people who worship money, we have banks and retirement accounts and financial planners. and we, For people who worship education, we have colleges. For people who worship technology, we have iPhones. For people who worship sex, we have porn sites. For people who worship politics, we have talk radio and cable news channels galore. We have idols of self. Probably the worst idol is the worship of self. It's when you make yourself 
into your own God and you bow down and worship yourself every day. Nothing more dangerous than a man who worships himself or worships his individual freedom or worships self-determination or worships self-discovery. This is, this is the idol of control. It's when we worship our own strength and our own power. That's where health and fitness becomes an idol. Interestingly, aging usually decapitates that idol. We have gods of religion. This is the temptation for those of us who are professional Christians, pastors and church planters and people that try to make disciples and glorify God can actually, if we're not careful, we can actually end up worshiping ministry or worshiping church. Did you know that it's possible to actually worship? Worship? How twisted do you have to be to do that? You can do it. How do you do that? It's like, well, I like my worship traditional. Well, I like my worship contemporary. I like it when the lights move. I don't like it when the lights move. It's, it's like, and so we start creating, like, I want my worship to be this. That is idolatry. We're missing the whole point of what we're doing. We're doing that. It's, it's to give glory to God. It's not to give anything to us. It's possible that we have idols of ideology. Isn't it interesting how the word ideology and idols sound very similar? Whether it's a conservative ideology, capitalism, socialism, anything can become an idol. And there's probably no greater idol in America today than the idol of presidential politics. Those of us who are conservative politically um, have to be careful that we don't mix up conservative policy with conservative personality and somehow start bowing down to a personality or a policy for that matter. When we begin to trust in man-made systems of government to fix our fallen spiritual problems, we're in danger of idolatry. I don't know how you interpreted what you saw happening on the Capitol steps and in the Capitol building on Wednesday. I saw a worship service as people fought for control. It's not something that just started on Wednesday. It's, and it's not just on one side of the aisle. It's, it's, it's people who refuse to let go of that which is most central to their security. An ideology or a, a position or a power. When you can't distinguish between policy and personality, you can easily be swept up into what Albert Moeller calls the cult of personality. And it's a temptation for all of us, no matter who the personality is. Have I hit your idol yet? You want me to keep going? How do I identify my idols? These four things. First of all, look at your daydreams. What do you just find in yourself like, I wish, I want, if only I could have. Be careful of those two words, if only if only this would happen, if only I could, if only God did. Careful, those can become idols. Look at your nightmares. What do you currently have that you are terrified of losing? Is it control? Health? Relationship? Position? Career? Title? Friend? Boyfriend, girlfriend, look at your emotions. What riles you up? What creates anger in your heart? What creates fear? What do you find yourself being jealous over? Are there things, are there things that, je that God is jealous over? Are there things that just you're jealous over? And then finally, look at your sacrifices. All idols demand sacrifices. And the two things that we give our idols most are our money and our time. And some of you can't sacrifice your time and your money to God because you spent your whole week sacrificing your time and your money to your idols. We have to be careful. 
Now, there's hope. Did I mention this is a message of hope? Aren't, don't you feel so hopeful now? This is like, like, wait, wait, I'm supposed to feel hopeful. Remember, Isaiah is warning these people and telling them you don't have to be assimilated and absorbed into a pagan culture of idol worship. Look here at Isaiah 45. Just skip to the next chapter here. Let your eyes go down to verse 20. Isaiah 45, 20 says this. Assemble yourselves. Come, draw near together. It's the opposite of social distancing. He says, assemble yourselves together. Come near. You can't do this alone. You can't fight the battle against idols alone. You need to assemble. You need other people that are moving in the same direction. You need to be aligned. You all need to be worshiping the same thing together. You are survivors. Don't you love that word? You, like, what's another word for a Christian? I'm a survivor. Survivor among all these pagan idols. Don't do that. You're a survivor of the nations. He says, they have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God who cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none beside me. Verse 20, turn. You idol worshipers, turn. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Do you know what he's, he's recognizing there? He's recognizing the universal fallen condition of man that he knows he needs to be saved. But it is also recognizing the propensity to turn to idols to save us. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be saved from sin. He wants you to be saved from idol, worshiper, idol worshiping. He wants you to be saved from your fears. He wants you to be sa saved from being consumed with things that don't matter for eternity. So he invites you as a righteous God. Yes, he's jealous. Yes, he's righteous. But he says, I am a savior. You have fear. You have sin. You can be saved. I'm the only one that can do it. Come to me now. I'm going to ask Micah to come and he's going to help me preach the message through song as we conclude here today. Here's the good news of the gospel. Every person in this room is an idol worshiper. I'm your leader. I worship myself. I worship my control. I turn to money. I turn to things that I think give me security. And all together, we need to come daily, weekly, and cast down our idols. And those idols can so grip our lives that sometimes we just need some time and space to slow down and evaluate what has gripped my heart? Where has an idol peeled off a piece of my heart? Why is it that I have no energy and emotion and love to sacrifice for God? It's probably because I've given what belongs to God to other things. So as we conclude here, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna ask you to contemplate here, to listen to the Spirit of God Reflect on what we've said. Reflect on what God has said through his word this morning. And reflect on the words of this song as Micah leads us.